The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, Mindful Living Masterclass. Um, <clears throat> my name is Elisha Goldstein. I just want to double check and make sure that everyone everyone can hear me right now as I'm beginning. Um, uh, before we kind of go on, I just want to make sure that everyone here can actually hear me, and then we will continue on. Um, I think I, I might see that in the chat. Um, Let's see. I can hear you. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, making change stick. And when mindfulness isn't enough in life, um, this is all a, uh, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be talking about so a lot of the foundations um, in a six month coaching program I have called a course in mindful living. Um, but when you're going to leave here, you're going to leave here with stuff that you can walk away with and begin to implement immediately. Uh, and um, okay, hopefully we can check in with everyone else and make sure they can they can hear too. I'm sure they can. So here's what we're going to be covering today: um, why change is simple, but four reasons we often fail. Um, how failure is our best ally. Um, also, how to fail better. Um, six habits that will lead to lasting change. So in other words, we have to be aware of the difficulties and the obstacles that are there in order to um, begin making changes and making lasting changes that are there. Because the reality is when we're trying to make the changes we want to make, it doesn't matter whether that's with eating right or exercising well or whether it's creating a meditation practice, um, uh, there's uh, obstacles to everything. And so um, now we're trying to learn about uh, not just the obstacles, but six habits that will help, help um, us uh, sustain that change in because of those obstacles, in other words. So then we're going to talk about the hidden drivers, sustaining commitment and change. And at the end, um, I'll talk to you about a, a possibility for um, getting into the next free mindful change coaching call. Okay. So um, what is a change you'd like to make in the next year? I don't know if through this medium we have the opportunity or the ability for people to chat in at all. Um, Gabe, you can let me know that, um, whether they're able to chat in or send a message at all, um, at all, and I think it might come in through this questions area. But if you are there and you're able to um, go ahead and kind of put this in the window there somewhere, like what's a change you'd like to make in the next year? Uh, you know, just considering that, whether that's uh, something to do with um, getting your eating under control or whether that has to do with better sleeping habits or more focus at work or anything like that. Um, I'm wondering if everyone ha here has the ability to chat in at all. Um, and you can share your answers here. You can see where it says John Grohl to all. Um, it looks like you're able to chat into that window potentially. Um, and um, then we can see, we can get a sense of the community here. Um, just also wanting to see if, um, making sure people can actually hear. Um, I know uh, John and Gabe can hear, but I'm just wondering um, if other people here can actually hear what we're what we're doing. So go ahead and chat in if you don't mind, just kind of send a message in there just to make sure that you can hear um, and that also if you want to chat in with a change you'd like to make in the next year, we can begin to work with you sort of specifically. Um, questions. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything there. I'm not seeing it. Okay, that's all right. So as long as Gabe, as long as you're seeing something there, that's fine. I don't see anything under the questions. Um, but it sounds like you might. Uh, okay. Um, Gabe, can you confirm? Okay. Can you confirm that you're getting responses from people here? Um, I'm seeing it from you. I'm seeing these coming from you. Okay, great. Okay, so you're seeing them. I just can't see them, which is fine. Okay, that's all that matters. Um, Gabe is, okay, I'm John. Okay, great. Up. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so welcome. Um, so we see things like be more social, um, become a writer, um, be more maybe consistent with your writing, um, and uh, great. So okay, so here's here's uh, interesting. So if we were if we were to have more responses here, we'd probably see things like a lot of people have uh, want to exercise more, want to get better nutrition habits, um, want to get a better meditation practice going, a regular one, um, and then you know, we find that it's really difficult. 
So here's how a positive habit changes in a nutshell, the way that I see it. Habits are grown from experiences of an action or mindset. When we consciously engage behaviors or activate states of mind on a regular basis, they become implicit and are integrated as traits. Um, so we have to intentionally practice and repeat something over time for it to become automatic. Many of us try when we're trying to make changes in our lives. We try, nowadays there's a plethora of different apps, self-learning online courses. Um, we try and do things on our own. So meditation just being an example here. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's hard um, you know, to, to do that because we have um, obstacles that come up and it's really hard to do it alone. Sometimes we reach out to a therapist or a coach or something like that. And that seems to be really helpful or a friend or a mentor. Um, and they can help with guidance and help us pick us up during the inevitable downs that we experience. Um, and that could be really powerful. So four reasons we often fail, we're wired against change. Our brain would rather be more comfortable, stay in a more comfortable place um, than actually go and risk even necessarily a good thing that might happen, but uh, um, you know, risk change if there's a potential for failure because we're wired to kind of stay away from what's uncomfortable and move towards what's comfortable. So if you're trying to make a change in your life and there's a possibility that you might fail or there might be challenge or difficulty in front of you, um, you know, your brain is more wired to stay with status quo because it's simply just more comfortable. Uh, and um, you know, we, we, many of you are familiar with this term, the negativity bias. We are wired towards um, to be more attentive towards what's negative or difficult than what's towards what's more, um, let's say positive. And the reason is, is because uh, our ancestors years ago, and many of you might be familiar with this, the ones that were sitting around and just being aware of the good that's there weren't aware of the lions and tigers and bears around them. And so they didn't last. Um, and so the ones that were overly nervous and anxious and uh, being aware of the dangers, hypersensitive to that are the ones that pass their genes on to us. So we happen to have an overly nervous system. And what this does is it makes us focus on the negative more than the positive and exaggerates the negative, in fact. And so when we're trying to make a change and something comes in our way or it's difficult, our brain might say, ah, oh, this isn't, that's a, I told you it wasn't, <laughs> you weren't going to be any good at this, or this is going to be too hard for you, or something like that. And just um, the doubt, the implicit and subtle doubts that come in, the self-critical um, thoughts that come in are really powerful. Um, the other thing is we're programmed to distraction. Those of you who are here right now might even be distracted at this very moment. Um, we have these phones now that have really kind of trained our mind towards being uh, distracted. Um, what we practice and repeat is what we get, and the more we practice and repeat, um, switching between tasks or picking up our phone and putting it down, the more we're training ourselves to, um, uh, to, uh, to be more distracted more often. So it's hard to, when you're trying to make a change you want to make, you have to be focused. And it's hard to be focused um, if we're constantly being distracted. So um, the other thing is, if you look around you and consider all the people around you who you spend most of your time with and ask yourself the question, who around me, by the very thought of them or the very presence of them, actually inspires me to make the changes I want to make? Um, typically, people show a pretty um, a, a map that's not that doesn't have such high ratings. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have friends that are, that those friends aren't supportive. Uh, but what it does mean is that uh, there's a lack of implicit inspiration um, around us. And so these are four reasons we often fail. So we'll talk about these. We'll go through them. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. Uh, and so it starts with intention. So here's why failure is our best ally, why we want to embrace it. Obstacles are inevitable. That's just it and necessary during our journey to change. If you ever thought it was any different where you're going to start something that's a complex task and you're going to try and make a habit out of it and there wasn't going to be any obstacles there, then um, that's not, uh, there's, there's a lack of awareness of how human nature works. Um, and so you just embrace that. I'm going to try and make this change. There's going to be obstacles in my way. They give us the opportunity to build key strengths and support sustainable habit change. So look at this um, uh, map that I created, which uh, we talk about habit change on one axis and time on another. And on the one hand, if you look to the left, you see that I can do this. I'm really kind of hopeful and positive. And then what happens is something difficult happens. We have a stress appraisal that this is harder than I thought our mind says, and we bring some mindfulness to it, which just means awareness. And we just say, oh, that's a thought that I'm having. Um, we soften our body, we begin to refocus again, something else happens, we get sick maybe, and then we start getting really bummed out, dysphoria, we say, oh, here it is again, this is just like a, 
uh, this thing coming over me, just a feeling that's here. That's the mindfulness. We begin to focus again. We're a little stronger than before because we've been using these strengths of mindfulness to begin working through difficulty. Something happens again. We get a setback or maybe we, if it's eating, we start to binge or we eat a, a big ice cream cone. I don't know. could be anything, right? And so then we go down, mindfulness again, uh, and then we focus again. And then we learn the strength of self-compassion, which is the recognition that we're having a difficult moment with the inclination to want to support ourselves and rec the recognition that we're not alone in this. And so what happens is we are um, we can develop the skills towards self-soothing, which regulate us and help us to refocus again. So here's what happens here. Then we have a positive appraisal that says, I'm okay, life is good. Um, we're aware of the good that happens and we get these credit card bills. Our attention becomes constricted. We say, oh my God, I don't think I can afford this anymore, whatever change I'm trying to make. Um, we say, what if I have another setback now? We start to feel fear. Then we go, oh, fear, fear, fear. This is what fear is. It's human nature. Moment of mindfulness. What do I need right now? A moment of self-compassion. We apply that self-soothing. We feel good again. I'm feeling in the flow. I can really handle these challenges that are here. We start to feel good, positive emotion. We begin to savor it. We have increased engagement with life and a sense of meaning and purpose. So this is, to me, a um, uh, like something that can happen over the course of, let's say, a few months let's say. Um, so this is a change cycle in a few months. You can see this is a change cycle in a lifetime, but you can see how there's ups and downs. And we often don't, we oftentimes get lost in the downs and we think that's the only thing that's there. Helen Keller said, when one door of happiness closes, another one opens. But often we look so long at the closed door that we do not see the one which has opened for us. So we're oftentimes so stuck in um, the difficulty that's there that we're not aware of the possibility for change. So how to fail better, the six habits that will lead to lasting change. Now, these are the six foundations that are um, in a six month online coaching program I have called A Course in Mindful Living. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you what these are and we're gonna talk about the actions you can take immediately with them and the benefits that are there. Um, okay, so the first one, relax. Setting the foundation for getting a grip on your mind. The benefits of relaxing that we know in science now is it improves your overall focus. You know that because when you see relaxed students in a room, they're able to focus and attend better than the ones that are squirreling and restless in their seats. They help us to learn and integrate in more information and it improves cognitive brain functioning and decision making. So, um, you know, when you see people relaxing, just relaxing, know that taking time to actively relax is actually good for them. So you can actually in your mind say, good for you. Um, that's really great that you're taking time to relax. In our culture right now, we don't really value relaxing. We like to say we like to relax, um, but uh, when we see people just relaxing or lounging, sometimes we um, think they're kind of useless uh, members of our society. And so we need to teach ourselves kind of the value of relaxing in periods and moments of our lives. The action you wanna take right now, notice where you brace in your life. Um, quite literally, where is your body tense? Is it in the morning, afternoon, evening? Is it uh, in um, certain contexts with your family, with your partner? Is it with colleagues or coworkers? Uh, you know, where do you brace? And then you want to be on the lookout for that, and you quite literally want to begin to soften your body. Arthur Ashe had a very relaxing statement, which says, "Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can." Habit number two, mindfulness and focus, the hidden drivers for staying on course. Benefits of mindfulness and focus. Again, mindfulness just meaning awareness. I'm um, just having an awareness. Focus meaning being able to attend to a particular thing. Um, and the benefits is to be, of mindfulness, which has been, sh again, shown in many research articles and studies is that it reduces the frenetic mind. It quite literally turns the volume down on the part of your brain that is constantly self-referencing, um, telling the story of me, um, what, what is this? How does it apply to me? It's the, it's the part that lights up around worry and rumination. Um, it's also the part that tries to figure other people out and it's, it lights up when there's empathy because we're, it's trying to kind of think about how this person is feeling right now and can maybe connect with them. So it's not a, a bad part of your brain, but it is associated with worry and rumination. And what we want to do sometimes is be able to turn the volume down on that, to turn the volume down our anxiety and our depressive thinking. So it also increases clarity of thinking because when you're able to step into the space between stimulus and response, um, you're able to see more of the choices that are there for you. So 
So you're more clear on what, and have greater perspective on what matters. And then if you're able to do that and you're able to focus for a more sustained period of time, you clearly increase productivity. Um, a program that I created called the Mindfulness at Work program that was studied by both Aetna and eMindful.com, published, published in the Journal of Occupational Health, showed that um, having consistent mindfulness practice over time increased productivity by about 69 minutes per week. So, um, you know, this is real stuff. And so these are strengths for your brain. These are strengths for your life. Um, if you want to make the changes you want to make in your life, these are two strengths so far that I've shown you. Being able to relax, being able to have mindfulness and focus. The action you want to take right now to begin training it is just to pick something you want to do and just do it for a sustained period of time and just do that one thing. So in other words, if you want to practice um, working out, just work out. See, just for 10 minutes, you can take the headphones out of your ears. You don't look at the TV at the gym. You just focus on your body working out. Just notice the sensations of the workout. It doesn't mean that listening to music or watching TV is bad, but we, all we want to do is um, do make a formal practice out of focusing. Right? When you're emailing, just do email. Don't email and then check your social media and do that. See how long you can just do email for. Um, if you get distracted or you get taken away, just take note of that. Say to yourself, distraction, gently bring your attention back. Eat, just come to your senses and eat. That's all. Just eat. Uh, bring awareness to the uh, the sight of the eating, the, the flavors that are there, just pay attention to eating. Again, five, 10 minutes, something like that. Then you can go on and uh, multitask if you want to. But remember, what you practice and repeat is what you get. So if you want to practice focusing more, put your phone away typically and um, practice whatever you're doing for a sustained period of time. David Allen said, if you don't pay appropriate attention to what has your attention, it will take more of your attention than it deserves. Habit number three, trust in yourself. Why self-compassion and forgiveness are the trump cards for the inevitable challenges, benefits, reduces self-critic and doubt. If we can be aware of the difficulty that we're having, remember, remember, um, self-compassion means re the recognition of a difficulty with the inclination to want to support myself and recognizing I'm not alone in this. So the benefits of this are um, if I'm having a difficult moment and I can say to myself, hey, this is a difficult moment. And in life, there's difficult moments. That's just part of life. Um, how can I be kind to myself or what do I need right now? We're going to reduce in that moment all the doubting that's going on, all the self-critical thinking in that moment that's fueling anxiety and depression. Um, also, we're, we're, we're sharing with ourselves that we're worth paying attention to, and so we increase our sense of self-worth. And finally, if you are doing these things, you'll increase your sense of resilience in the face of difficulties. In other words, if you're feeling more well, we know that when we're feeling our well, the, the, our perception is typically less focused on what's wrong with me um, in the face of a difficulty and tends to be more like water off a duck's feathers. So if we can reduce a self-critic and doubt and increase our sense of self-worth, we are automatically increasing our sense of resiliency in the face of the inevitable obstacles that come our way. Um, so action number one, self-compassion. Take regular self-compassion breaks. Um, what that means is, you, again, you recognize a difficult moment, you know it's a human experience, you understand your needs, and you move towards self-soothing. Um, and uh, the simple move towards self-soothing is just, if I'm needing to feel safe, if I'm needing to feel some sunshine on my face, if I'm needing to feel, call a friend, if I'm needing to find connection, if I'm needing these different things, I take my action alongside of it, and um, that's the experience of self-compassion. Along the, along the way, we'll kind of flip back to this real quick. Um, you see that there's ups and downs, right? Um, so what typically happens is Helen Keller said, you know, we do not see the one which is open for us because we're so stuck on the closed door. So what we want to do is practice this practice of forgiveness, which, and, and grow from it, and grow from the obstacles. So we forgive ourselves for the time gone by, the difficulty, the challenge, the, the straying, um, alongside the habit journey. That's the past. We can't do anything about it. In fact, we can just investigate and learn maybe why I got off track, bring the, the essential um, uh, quality of mindfulness, that engaged curiosity. And then we can, with that new knowledge and learning, we can invite ourselves to begin again. Helen Keller said, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition be inspired, and success be achieved. So difficulties are important. They're a part 
of our growth journey. Habit number four, savor. How positive emotions are fuel for resiliency, success, and happiness. So we also need to be aware of the good and we need to be able to ride the good moments that are there too. We know that savoring um, improves physical health. Uh, we know that it has uh, correlates with uh, a positive emotions of correlates with um, high vagal tone, which, which is the, the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve that connects our brain to our heart. Um, and we know that positive emotions are correlated with higher vagal tone, which is typically when we feel more relaxed, focused, um, confident, when we feel more anxious and depressed, it has low vagal tone. So there's a, there's a connection between positive emotions and high vagal tone. Um, we know that when we, positive emotions, there's a ratio, ratios that have been going around for quite a while, three to one, um, three positive emotions to one negative emotion um, tends to help us feel, uh, make us feel more balanced. Um, uh, when we have five positive interactions in a relationship versus one negative interaction in a relationship, it, it tends to be more balanced because the negative one counts so much more in our lives. So the more positive emotions we can build, and this isn't just about go ahead and be positive out there. Um, this, this is just that there's ways to begin to bring savoring, more acknowledgement of the good that's already there and imprint that memory in our mind a little more and increase the ratio of positive and negative. So it, that, that inevitably also increases resiliency during the tough moments and also just feels good. So action number one, take a joy break. Here's what it looks like. This is a good moment. In life, there are good moments. Can I savor this? So when you notice a good moment, you say to yourself, this is a good moment. In life, there are good moments. Can I savor this? So play with that. Again, there's something just to experiment with, play with it, see what you notice. Action number two, practice embodied gratitude. Make a daily list and feel into each one. So in other words, you can make a gratitude list, like a gratitude journal, that's fine. It's, it, but what's more impactful is you actually visualize what you're grateful for and um, allow yourself to feel in your body. So in other words, here's a sample list for me. Health of my family, I can go through the different family members that I have, um, the ones that are healthy. I can say that I can kind of feel and sense their health and feel, um, I'll be happy for their, uh, I can visualize or feel myself in my bed, my comfortable bed and feel the comfort of the bed. So you can like feel it. You're actually activating more parts of your brain um, when you are uh, visualizing these uh, and embodying them. So just consider that. Gratitude list is good, better than nothing, um, but actually embodied gratitude is a whole different experience. Action number three, practice. Really, and you, by the way, you can do that in the morning and the evening. This doesn't have to take like extra time out of your life. Um, you can do that as a stoplight. Um, practice relational joy. Um, see people having good moments. I mentioned this a little earlier. And practice encouraging thoughts. You see people who are exercising out there. See people who are in meditation. See people who are working at schoolwork. People who are doing things that you think are good for them. Um, in your mind, you say, good for you. You're a human being just like me who is doing things that are good for you. Um, and so I'm practicing encouraging thoughts towards you. And just see what you notice. Again, I'm giving you these tips, these actions um, to do that are part of the six foundations of um, making change stick in your life um, to be able to ride that habit journey um, in a more successful way. Um, and positive emotions is one of those, um, one of those that increases resiliency. So this is a way to increase positive emotions uh, um, uh, relationally. No one deserves to be more happy than you do. That's my message to you. No one deserves to be more happy than you do. Habit number five, accept change. The key to never, ever getting stuck again. Never, ever getting stuck again. So here we are again. Here is this um, habit journey. Keep this in your mind. There's inevitable ups and downs. You can see that there is no linear line to making the changes you want to make in your life. There will always be obstacles. You just have to know that and take a, take a step out. See, from here you can see perspective. Oh, hey, this is me over the next six months. There's ups and downs. Um, okay, so what do I do during the down period? Okay, let me plan for that. Um, that's gonna help you. And so what strengths can support me and create more resiliency? That's what we're talking about. So accept change. You have to accept the reality that there's change. The benefits of the accepting change and having that perspective is you get unstuck sooner. You're grateful for the highs. I know this isn't gonna last. So I'm just happy for this moment being here. And you're more graceful during the lows because you know lows are all part of it. And you can bring mindfulness and self-compassion to the lows. So you have increased perspective and focus on what matters in the moment too. 
because what matters when I'm in the low is taking care of myself. What matters in the high is that I'm enjoying that good moment. I have it, I enjoy it. Maybe if I'm doing well, I can also be more giving to others. You know, so things like that. Um, and so it gives you that kind of perspective. So accept change. Action number one, sometimes to get perspective, I throw myself into the, the future. One year, one week, one month, a year, five years, 10 years, depends on what it is. Um, I did this for myself when I was in my mid-20s. It led to me becoming a psychologist and a mindfulness teacher. I threw myself into many years in the future, and I was in the corporate world at the time, and I said, what will, when I'm, you know, 40 years from now, what will I have wished I would have done? Continued in this place that I'm in right now, um, or done something um, different? And so uh, I could feel into that Elisha 40 years from then, 40 years from that moment, looking back onto me in that moment, and it created perspective. See, nothing creates perspective more than space. And so we can, we can create space in our, own, in our own minds. By the way, meditation creates space, but doing this type of visualization can also create space and give you perspective on what matters in the moment. Um, things are going to change. How do I want them to change? Um, I can learn to cause the effects I wanna see in my life. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. So throw off the bulliness, sail away from safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. This is the time. This is the time to take care of yourself. This is the time to do the things and invest in yourself in a way that's going to support you in the next year, two years, three years of your life to look back and say, um, I did this for me. Uh, and um, you want to consider that. Habit number six, connect. The often missing key to sustaining change. Sometimes we think we can just do all this stuff on our own. A human being is part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something kind of separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. That was Albert Einstein who said that. So in other words, and now quantum physics has really um, uncovered more and more that we are so interconnected. It's not even, uh, there's nothing, um, there's a, no mysticism to that anymore. Um, there's actually science behind it. So the reality is if I'm mean to somebody, um, somehow that might come back to me <laughs> because, because we're all part of this inter, interrelated whole in some way, although we're separate and differentiated at the same time. Um, but, but we have to understand that connection um, is important. There's a reality around emotional and behavioral contagion that that's also has uh, a lot of depth in science, meaning like when some person does something or feels a certain way, that it might impact your friend's friend's friend. Um, that's studies that have been done by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. Um, and so um, there's a reality around emotional behavior and contagion. So the benefits of <clears throat> going back to this connection is you're naturally more inspired to change. So if you have, as an example, um, people around you who are inspiring to you, you make, you make contact with people who they're doing the things you wanna do. Um, and so the very sight of them or thought of them is inspiring to take the actions you want to take that are alongside your intentions and values. That's a natural benefit. Um, you feel more supported and accountable for your habits when you have more people around you that are doing the things you want to do. And you also can learn from others and be more aware of maybe what, what options are to take. That's why a lot of people in business you know, join business groups because um, it inspires them, it motivates them. Um, that's why you see people in AA you know, there. There's something about the community that's supportive you see people that are getting up there and talking about the successes they're having. It's inspiring. Um, so there's a reality around uh, connection. There's a real connection just feels good anyway. It's at the epicenter of feeling well, but there's a reality around being connected with people who are inspiring to you. Action number one, think of people that you care about in your life, a loved one, yourself, a neutral person, and say in your mind, may you be happy. May you be healthy. Um, send up these friendly intentions. What you're doing is visualizing the action of connection. And it's a friendly connection too. And your brain, as it turns out, um, even just a visualizing this connection, you feel more connected. Again, you can try this out for yourself. It may be a little clunky at first, um, but um, this is a classic uh, version of the um, loving kindness meditation um, that you can find. I've, I have a number of... Um, meditations on that. You can go on my website, elishangolstein.com, go under videos. You can find different versions of the loving kindness meditation um, for free. 
and, um, and this can increase your sense of connection. And the second thing is take a relationship inventory. Uh, think of the 10 people you make the most contact with, rate them on a scale of one to 10, least inspiring to most inspiring. Um, see where you might need to reevaluate, uh, you know, who you want to make contact with. Does it, again, doesn't mean that you need to throw your friends and coworkers out. Doesn't even mean there's people in your life that are difficult people that you, you have to spend time with. That's different. That's another workshop that we'll do another time. Um, but for now, the idea is to kind of see if you can maybe curate slightly your social circle or curate who you make contact with. And yes, texting and I, and, uh, and um, video chatting and stuff like that count. Um, just making more frequent contact with people who are inspiring to you. If you, have, if you don't know where people are that are inspiring to you, um, this is the exact reason I created a course in Mindful Living was to help people find other people in community um, they can create relationships with that they can naturally become more inspired over time while going through a um, a, a, a six-month curriculum that has the highest of integrity um, that builds all these foundations we're talking about today and goes in depth with them. So now, what's the hidden driver to making the changes we want to make lasting? Here's the truth: in order to make all the whatever change you're wanting to make. So if I go back to the list over here and I see be more social, um, I say become a writer and you know, if there's more people kind of chatting in, I would see exercise, eating, meditation, these types of things. Um, I would, I'd say you need guidance. You need someone who's been there before, someone, or someone who's professionally trained, either way. And um, you need inspiration, support, and accountability. Uh, you need to establish a, a sustainable new habit. Um, you need time to establish that. So in other words, if you wanted the habit to be drinking water every morning, that might take 21 days. If you want to create a lasting meditation practice or life, change your diet as a lifestyle or exercise more or get that writing practice going, um, those are a little more complex. So I would say those take three, six months, something like that. So um, you don't want to do this alone. You need the guidance, you need inspiration, support, and accountability with all of these pillars. And you need time to establish a sustainable new habit. You need that time. It's, there's no cheating time. Um, we didn't learn how to walk by just getting up and walking. Um, some animals do, it's not us. And so you have to practice and repeat something over time and it starts to become automatic. So in order for you, to, you need sustained commitment in order to make positive brain change. You also need experiential, experiential integration and you need that mentor and peer support. You can just go again, go to AA, you know, these to Alcoholics Anonymous or some other groups like that. And you see that the reason some of those are successful is because they have that mentor and peer support and they have experiences that they give you over time. So this is where, um, this is again, the reason, and I'll just say this again, the reason I created a course in Mindful Living is because I saw a complete absence of this in the court in the world where people were trying to make the changes they wanted to make. Um, you just don't see it. And so I knew there were these pillars of strengths that can help people go through that change cycle, a journey of change that was there, the good moments and the more challenging ones. Jim Rohn said, you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. And now we have some science that sort of backs that up. Um, so in A Course in Mindful Living, and I'm just going to tell you about this because this might be the most important five minutes of your life, um, or at least <laughs> some version of that, because if you actually inevitably dove into this, which today is the, the um, final day of a pre-sale discount of 30% off to come in, the course itself begins October 16th, um, but you get a local and global network, critical inspiration, honest conversations, you get encouragement, accountability, you get learning and endurance. The answer to the lessons you want to learn, someone else had to learn the hard way. And so that's why we need mentorship. We need coaching. That's why that's so helpful to us is because we get a bit, we get some shortcuts that way um, because that's what we get from mentorship and community. So you get a network of mentors. These are past graduates who have been through this curriculum before. They know the ins and outs of it. Um, they know the challenges that are there. Um, they can help you, support you in overcoming those challenges and growing from them. Um, uh, we play with each other a lot. Again, in the beginning of the program, we talk about space. Of what, how do you, how you can you create space in your life um, for yourself for doing, making the changes you want to make in your life? And then also, like, where's your? Because we do practice meditation throughout the program. Where's your meditation space? Can you revamp it? People take pictures. You see all kinds of pictures of different people's meditation spaces. It becomes totally inspiring, um, and gives you ideas about what you can do to create space in your life. Um, we have live coping, coaching sessions every single month. You have a live session with me, and then two weeks later, you have a, a live coaching session with your teacher within the program. 
Um, you can also one-to-one -one personal message the teacher to get the support you need when you need it. Um, think of it as like a, a um, concierge coaching, you know, in some way. Um, but from a, a, a world-class mindfulness teacher. Um, and you meet over Zoom so you can see each other. Um, that, and you, know, you can, of course, turn off your video if you want to, but this helps you get to know people. It gives you, your brain, more areas of recognition for a human being. That's what helps support a relationship. But again, we have world-class mindfulness teachers who are coaches all over the world, um, and they're there to support you all along the way. You get a private um, group, coaching group, online coaching group that you end up having your own experience in, as well as the general community and the course itself. Again, live monthly events with me. We give you 10, 20, 30-minute practices throughout the program to really kind of um, give you practices that meet your lifestyle, um, meet the needs of your lifestyle. Sometimes we're busy, sometimes we have more time. Um, but you always have variations to be able to work with. Um, up to two hours of on-demand presentations per month around the, all these pillars that we've been talking about, relaxing, mindfulness, focus. How do you go deeper and understand it with me and with a variety of other experts out there? Um, we have 14 bonus interviews within the platform, which you may recognize some of these faces if you're, if you're able to see it. You know, people like Kristen Neff and Ellen Langer and Byron Katie and Dan Harris and Dan Siegel um, and, and so many more so many more. Um, we just get a guided curriculum. You also get weekly live meditations. You get a monthly book club if you're interested in that, um, that you have your own chats around, hand-picked -pick curated TED Talks. We have two meditation challenges throughout the program. We have prizes from Muse headsets to Mala bracelets to um, high-quality meditation cushions, you know, just for fun. That stuff's just for fun. Um, Joanna said, one of the best things that you will get out of the course is the resiliency to bounce back when the stress comes again. And that's really the key. Alongside the change journey, you're going to hit those obstacles. And that's where we get stuck. And with the encouragement of a community, with the encouragement of mentors, with the encouragement of coaches, you will be implicitly more resilient in making whatever change you want to make in your life and making it inevitably lasting because you'll hit that mark where the habit change will become a flow. So we have the ability to cause the effects we want to see in our lives. I'll say this, that right now it's about 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, this is the last day that we are doing our pre-sale 30% off discount, um, $400 off. And um, if you sign up between this moment right now and midnight tonight, um, I will enroll you in our, in our next masterclass that's, that, that, that is going to be a private masterclass. It's going to be a small group session with... Um, a number of people that um, is about a, a, per, a more of a personal dialogue, um, most likely over Zoom, so we can kind of engage with each other. Uh, and that's going to take place. I think I have that date wrong. It says Monday, October 5th, um, but it's Friday, October 5th is what I meant to say. And that's going to take place Friday, October 5th. So if, again, if you sign up between now and roll now and take advantage of a 30% because that will go up. Um, between now and midnight, you will be automatically enrolled in this Mindful Change Masterclass, a second version of it, um, and it's a personal dialogue uh, to go, um, go deeper with, with the changes you want to make. So any questions? I don't know if I can field questions here, because I can't actually see the questions, but I'm sure John can um, pop them in. If anyone has any questions at all about any of this. Yeah, can uh, you hear me now, Elijah? I can hear you. Ah, yep. excellent, excellent. Yeah, there seemed to be a problem with the, uh, the the mic earlier, but now we're here. Yep, if you can just pop your questions into the question um, little box, just type them right in. I'll read them, and, and Elijah will answer them. So we'll give those a minute. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. It was an uh, excellent course. We... We appreciate having you back. You're a you're a longtime supporter of Psych Central, and uh, this is, I believe, your your third webinar for us, correct? Oh yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I love your community, Gabe. It's really great. Oh, thank you so much. And for everybody, and, and not, not to men not to mention that I I'd been blogging on Psych Central for about ten years. Almost. Oh my, that's the... <laughs> yeah. Yes. What is yeah. the name of your uh, blog over on Psych Central? Uh, it's called Mindfulness and Psychotherapy. It's one of the earlier blogs that was actually put on um, on Psych Central. Uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the, one of the one, one of the earlier ones, and it, and it really took off. And it was a uh, it was a great big blog for some time. There's not there's not there's there's an, an enormous amount of content um, that that's there um, under the Mindful Psychotherapy blog, um, and people can just continue to kind of mine that. You know. Uh, 
for themselves. And just keep reading it. Um, a question popped in that said, uh, if you don't think that mindfulness will work, will this class work for me? I, I believe I'm reading that correctly. Well, I, I will say that, you know, mind, mindfulness, this, this is more about kind of mindful living. So in, ever, in, in other words, if we go through this again and you see what the six pillars were, so it was like re learning how to relax, right? learning how to focus, learning the, the, the skills around self-compassion, learning the skill. These aren't, these aren't mindfulness skills and strengths. Mindfulness is a particular strength, just meaning awareness. But there's, but there's these, all these other strengths. That, that's why you see the title of my session saying when mindfulness isn't enough. Because mindfulness on its own is not enough to create sustainable habit change. So we need these, all these other pillars that are here that we went through today. Self-compassion. Um, we need the, 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 to instill the strength around acceptance. We need to instill the strength around positive emotions. Understand that. You know, how to begin to imprint them more in our minds. Um, and those will, all these things together will create greater resiliency alongside the, the journey of, of making that habit change that you're wanting to make. So mindfulness alone is not enough. So if you don't believe mindfulness will help you alone, then you're in the right camp because that's where we're at. Um, we, um, it's my experience and belief that you need all of these things and you do need the support of a community. Um, I mean, some people can do it alone, but really like nothing replaces the support of community and, uh, and over time, as well as someone who's been through it before, who can be a guide. And, you know, even a big, a bigger bonus is someone who's a professional um, who can be a coach, you know, all along the way. I hope that answers. If you have, if you have a follow-up question to that, I'm happy to, I'm happy to respond to a follow-up question too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And another question came in that said, if I don't want to learn these skills via webinar, do you offer in-person workshops? Uh, we're at, at, in, in Los Angeles, we have the Center for Mindful Living. Um, and so we do have in-person workshops there. Um, typically also, I'll just say about the course though, the course is not um, taught over just webinar. Um, we get, we pop into Zoom groups, which are, again, you saw maybe what, what one of those looks like, um, which is more like this, where we actually kind of see each other. We all see each other. And so we're actually like, it, it's the closest thing to being in, in person with us. Um, I also have, I don't know what, where you, where you are, but I have a, uh, a uh, upcoming retreat in, at Kripalu, which is in the Berkshires of Massachusetts um, in the beginning of December. And so um, that would be an in-person type of thing. And I speak um, all over the country, but the, but you know, this is actually quite impactful to have a group like this over a Zoom session in this way. Um, and so it's not just learning over um, a webinar. Yeah. <laughs> And I imagine if somebody goes to your website, they can sign up for an email list and find out when you're giving both webinars and in-person instruction. Oh, absolutely. You can go to the events section under my, um, under elishagoldstein.com and go under events and you can find all the upcoming events that are right there. Yeah. Wonderful. That aren't just webinar, in-person and all that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll give it about another 30 seconds to make sure there's no, uh, no additional questions or follow-up questions and then uh, we will be on our way out. Are there any final words? You know, I would say whether you end up, when you, whether you jump into this, I mean, whether you jump into this course or not, again, it starts October 16th. I'd love to be with you in there. Um, today is the final day for um, getting that, the, the, the pre-sale price to get in during that and to get the bonus of the free kind of personal masterclass with me. But the, but if you don't, like, just hold all of this. Just, I would say just practice and repeat what we've learned here today. Um, be easy with yourself. Um, be really forgiving with yourself. Again, if we go back to that, that graph, the habit change journey, having that perspective that there's going to be downs, your mind's going to try and get a hold of you, to be able to bring the awareness of saying, these are just my thoughts and this is this feeling that's here, and to be able to have the ability to strengthen the ability of what you're needing in that moment, um, and to be able to ride out that difficulty with grace takes practice. You know, that takes practice to ingrain that as an implicit response. And so, um, and what's supportive is to have people who are supportive to you in doing that. But regardless, what you, if you can just intentionally practice and repeat the strengths that we've talked here today, put some of those actions into action, um, be forgiving with yourself. Um, I guarantee that you'll start seeing some benefits um, from that. Um, but ultimately you need to do this over time. Nothing replaces time and having a community and mentors to support you along the way to go deeper is the most is the greatest sure shot you have um, towards creating more sustainable change in your life. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate everything. This video will appear on PsychCentral.com's YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com slash PsychCentral, um, in roughly about 24 hours. And uh, we thank you again, Elijah, and we will see everybody next month on the Psych Central webinar series.